So, um, we will continue with what uh, we were doing in the last class. We were looking at uh, a broad uh, picture or perspective of uh, vehicle dynamics. Uh, so, we were looking at uh, how we are going to approach the subject of vehicle dynamics. We said that for us, though there is a vehicle, it has its components and so on. When we are studying vehicle dynamics, we said the center of this whole thing is the mathematical model. So, the mathematical model comes from uh, our good old Newton, Euler-Newton equations and this has an input and an output. Remember that when we looked at the dynamics, okay, which is defined by using these mathematical equations, they are classified into what we called as longitudinal dynamics lateral dynamics and vertical dynamics. Okay. We said that we classify the dynamics what we are going to study using this mathematical model into a longitudinal lateral and vertical dynamics. We also said that for the ease of understanding its effect we may most of the times delineate or decouple them and study them in isolation. Is that correct? Is it does it not have an effect or one has an effect on the other? Yes, there is it is possible there is an effect, but in order to understand the subject most of the time we will be decoupling the effects of all these three. Right? There are very important things that will happen uh, like load transfer and all that we will understand it as we go along. We also said that the input for this model is the driver's uh, input through the steering or the acceleration and braking. Okay. In other words, how the driver interacts with the vehicle. Right? That is what we are going to use as an input. We said that we cannot uh, look at every scenario by the driver and we will have some test conditions okay, in order to understand the behavior of the vehicle. Of course, we said that the vehicle itself which goes into this mathematical model will be defined by means of certain parameters okay, what we call as kinematic and compliance parameters uh, mass, moment of inertia, compliance, stiffnesses and so on. The output from this model as we said yesterday are in terms of displacements, accelerations, okay, velocities and so on. We said that what comes out as an output has an effect on the occupants okay, and we are going to study that uh, not to a great extent, but at least as an introduction we are going to study how this is going to have an effect uh, on the occupants. Okay. So, this is uh, the broad uh, I would say basis on, under which we are going to study uh, the subject. We also said that we can again look at it from a different perspective and call this as driving dynamics okay, safety. and right comfort. When we look at this from a different perspective, same problem, we are going to look at it from a different perspective. Okay. So, it is not, it is not organized like this, it is not that longitudinal dynamics is driving dynamics, lateral dynamics is safety, vertical dynamics is right comfort. It is to a certain extent it can be looked at it like that, but they are not necessarily a clear demarcation like what we have here. So, we would look at the safety uh, uh, during driving okay, both in the longitudinal as well as in the 
lateral dynamics right okay we will continue now with this uh, short introduction and we are now going to look at this mathematical model okay and already we know or we had a very 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 simple model in the last class we are now going to extend this model simple model into not a very complex model but just the same model simple model making it more elaborate it's not going to we are not going to make it very complex we're going to use the same equations f is equal to ma okay so in other words we directly plunge into what is called as the longitudinal dynamics and look at a very simple mathematical model that we will be using in order to understand the longitudinal dynamics Whenever we talk about dynamics, two things that comes to our mind, the very first thing are the forces that are going to act on this vehicle and the other is of course, the acceleration or deceleration and so on. And our good friend F is equal to ma from, our, from Newton is going to be of great help okay, in writing down this mathematical model. Okay. So, the first things first. So, what are the forces that are acting on the vehicle? Okay. All of us have experienced this. The first, okay, one of the external, we are looking at the external forces. The external force that acts on the vehicle okay, is what is called as the aerodynamic force, which we would call as Ra. Okay. The other force, next force which is important to us, which is acting on this body is the gravitational pull or gravitational force okay. and that you can write it as m g or w and that can of course, be resolved into two directions like this and that if this is equal to if this is e, uh, of course, is equal to theta s. Yes. So, if I call this as w then we have what is this w cos theta and w sin theta. You may have a, a trailer you know towing uh, with this vehicle which is called as a drop bar. So, if you have a vehicle or if you have a uh, have another trailer with you, then there will be a, a draw bar pull which you would call as F t clear. Apart from this, the vehicle itself is going to give us some force, okay. some nice guys, some not so nice guys. So, if I am not, I am going to accelerate, okay, we need what is called as the traction force. Okay. So, the traction force is now going to act in that direction. So, let us say, let us put the traction force in the front and the rear. Okay. Let us look at this tractive force and call this as FF and FR. Of course, in every vehicle FF and FR will not act together or it may be a front wheel drive or it may be a rear wheel drive and so on. So, depending upon the front and the rear wheel drive, okay, you will have uh, either of the one or if it is a four wheel drive, then you will have all these things. Apart from, from this, one of the very important forces okay, which consumes our fuel okay, is what is called as the rolling resistance of the tire. The rolling resistance of the tire okay, acts opposite to, we will understand this rolling resistance in a minute, it acts opposite okay, to this tractive force okay, and in fact, it is something like a braking a force that acts on the vehicle. Right? Now, what is 
let us first understand, see up to this it is not very difficult to understand what are the forces that are going to act. Okay. What am I going to do? It is what I am going to do is very simple. I am going to find out the reactions of the front and the rear. Okay. Let us say that we are accelerating force, we are applying attractive force. So, we can say that I have a d'Alembert's force, actually it is not a force, it is a pseudo force okay, which can be written as W by G into A. Okay. It is not a good practice actually to put this d'Alembert's force, it is nice to write F is equal to MA, but then when I take some moments then it becomes easier for me to have a force there and that is the reason why I have a force and call as the d'Alembert's force. Okay. Now, all these forces are familiar to you. In order to uh, take the moment, of course, you need some dimensions. right? So, let us call, let us call the dimension something like this. Let us say that that length is equal to L 1 and that length is equal to L 2. L 1 is the distance from the front wheel to the C G location, L 2 is the distance from the C G location to the rear axle, the rear wheel and let the total length of the vehicle L 1 plus L 2, let it be called as L. The other thing that is important to us is the heights. Right. So, let us call this height as H A. Let us call the C G location height is equal to H and let me call that height to be H T. You know how to determine the uh, two uh, W's or the reactions at the wheels WF and WR. If I want to find out WF, I take, take a moment about WR okay, with proper signs, I can determine WF. In other words, WF into L okay, is equal to whatever the moments that are due to the other things. Okay. But before we go further, there are two comments that are important to us. One is the system that we are going to use this course, the x, y and the z direction that we are going to use in this course. Okay. This comes out of an ISO standard and we call the direction which is along the direction of travel okay, as x, perpendicular like that as y and the other direction normal to the ground as z. Okay. So, longitudinal, lateral, lateral and vertical directions. Of course, you know that there are motion, okay, the angular motion along these directions. For example, the angular motion in the direction of x, okay, in other words that angular motion okay, along the direction of x. Okay, let me that has to be a correct one, let us say positive, okay, that is positive, is called as, what is that angular motion called as? Roll. So, this is the roll and the angular motion okay, here, which is in the y direction, that is that angular motion is called as the pitch and that is what we call as yaw. Right? So, when you say very colloquially pitching, okay, that is moving in that direction. Right. Okay. So, that is the first thing. The second is, let us go into the details of what is called as rolling resistance. Rolling resistance is today very, very important for fuel consumption, especially in trucks can imagine that the rolling resistance whose origin are the tires consumes nearly 30 percent of the fuel of the vehicle. We are going to do quite a bit of tire dynamics in this course, 
But let us understand what is rolling, uh, rolling resistance and how do we get it quickly. We will go into details later just to understand because I am putting a force there. So, you have to understand what this rolling resistance is. Okay. Now, there is a misnomer. Many students assume that the rolling resistance is just the frictional resistance of the tire. Absolutely not. It is not the frictional resistance. Rolling resistance comes from the property of the elastomer or rubber. Okay, which is the material of the tire, elastomer or rubber as it is called, that is what goes into the manufacture of the tire. Elastomers have a property called viscoelasticity. Usually, depicted by a dash pot in order to understand in order to understand the effects clear now what is this viscoelasticity and how does that going to have an effect we'll see that in a minute as i said we will elaborate it later any material can be looked at small digression here, any material can be looked at from three simple models. One a spring, other a dash pot and third one is what I would call as a friction. Suppose I say that a material is purely elastic, okay, then you can say that the material can be represented by means of a spring. Okay. This is a, not a very correct representation. We are not going into too much of details. We can say that okay, a spring, a linear spring especially, okay, is good enough to uh, model say a linear elastic material. Okay. So, it is something like an understanding of the material behavior a linear spring where the force is proportional to the displacement with the stiffness k can be looked as if it is the material and k is something like e. Okay. So, when I leave the force the spring comes back to its original position and that is what we loosely call as elastic. Okay. Now, to this we can add other material behavior. For example, if you look at elastomers, elam, elastomers are elastic, of course elastic and then viscous behavior. Okay. So, in other words, I can model elastomer or I can understand elastomer as if it is made up of a spring and a dashboard. Okay. This dash pot can either be attached in parallel to look at it okay. or we can understand the behavior by attaching it like this and so on. There are names to these models, okay. Kelvin and the Maxwell models, but we are not going into the details of this models. Okay, we are putting this in order to understand okay, the behavior. For example, if you have a metal which you are taking into the plastic region, then I can model this metal using that spring and the friction element. Okay. So, you can uh, you know join together in parallel or series and so on you know these these elements you can join them and then 
write a mathematical equation which can form the basis of the constitutive equation or stress strain behavior okay, of the material. Now, we are not going into this as I told you into the characteristics and I am going to not going to write down equations here. We will understand only the elastomer part in this case. Maybe pass a comment afterwards about this friction and why friction is used is used to model what we call as plasticity. Now, what is the difference between an elastic material, the viscoelastic material? Sometimes people call this as hyperelastic, viscoelastic material, and so on. An elastic, first of all, let us understand that elastic material is not necessarily linear, it can be nonlinear elastic as well. So, if I now have a load deflection of the stress strain curve. Okay. When I load it, I load a material which means that I am applying forces, I keep increasing the force because of which the stresses increase and there is an increase in strain and so on. So, when I load the material, let us say that the path taken by the stress strain curve is something like that, goes like this. When I unload a material, an elastic material, it would actually, all of you know that it would follow the same path. On the other hand, a viscoelastic material does not follow the path when it is unloaded and would now follow a different path, a different path okay. and that amount of energy is lost and usually called as a hysteresis loss. Clear? So, there is an amount of energy that is lost, it is the same as plastic, there is a subtle difference, a good difference that though at the end of loading there is a residual strain here, the strain will come back to 0 with time. So, time is an important factor in viscoelasticity. Time and frequency are an important factor in viscoelasticity. Right. So, in other words, what, what I mean by time and frequency are important is that the material behavior is affected by the rate at which you load it or in other words the frequency at which you load it and so on. Okay. So, time and frequency are important factors. So, the first thing is that to conclude whatever we have been saying that there is a loss of energy when the material is loaded and unloaded. How is it going to affect us? Why is it that the tire should develop a rolling resistance? Okay, and that is what we are coming now. Now, let us say that I obviously all of you know it, but I am just reiterating what is well known. Let us say that I have a tire, we, we have what are called as treads. Let us say that that is a tread. Okay, and that is the ground. So, the thread material as it as it approaches is going to get let us say that it gets compressed and then again gets released. Okay. Why thread? But the material inside the tire which we are going to see what they are okay, also gets compressed and released or in other words there is a loading unloading cycle as the tire rolls, a loading unloading cycle as the tire rolls similar to what you see in this stress strain curve. So, in other words if I go and sit 
here in this thread okay, and go through the cycle of rolling. Right? I will go through a compression and then hold compression. As I come here, I, I get completely compressed. So go out, you know, the load on me gets released. So because of this cycle, okay, I lose energy, okay, or there is an hysteresis loss. Right? Now, who is going to compensate for this hysteresis loss? Because your vehicle has this tire, and tire is losing energy. So, who is going to compensate? The vehicle has to compensate. Okay, the vehicle has to compensate. So, the first thing is that because of the material of the tire, there is there are a lot of advantages. Let us not uh, why then rubber, you know, let us not talk about that because there are a lot of advantages, we will see that. Okay. So, because of the material uh, with which this tire is made of, we have a hysteresis loss okay, and the loss has to be compensated by the, uh, by the engine uh, ultimately and so this opposes the motion. Now let us understand how did I get this force? I said that there is a rolling resistance force which let us call this as F R. Okay, rolling resistance force, it can be the front and the rear. Okay. So, how did I get this as a force? Okay. So, in order to understand this, we have to look at what is called as the contact patch of the tire, contact patch of the tire. What is a contact patch? A patch that is formed obviously by contact of the tire with the road. In other words, more precisely, it is the pressure distribution at the contact. It is a pressure distribution at the contact. Right. So, we will see the three dimensional pressure distribution later or rather two dimensional pressure distribution later. Now, let us understand a, a section of this pressure distribution. Okay. So, let us say that I come into contact at that point and leave contact at that point. In other words, that is where my contact is. It is not necessary that the contact pressure exists only when the tire rolls. When the vehicle is stationary also, you have contact pressure. Let us for a moment stop the vehicle okay, and look at this contact patch. So, the contact patch now is not that of a one tread, okay, but there are a number of treads. So, the contact patch would look something like this. So, in other words, rubber is symmetrically compressed about the center. This is a vehicle that is standing, okay, symmetrically compressed about the center. So, whatever is the force that is compressed okay, by this and it has to be, it has to come out in the other side. Okay, whatever is compressed has to come out the other side. Okay. Now, let us understand one or two more things about tyres before we go into the details. The first is that the tyres that we use are what is called as pneumatic tyres. Okay. called it as pneumatic tires. In other words, 
we inflate the tire to a particular pressure, right. So, many of you may have, might have driven a car even now when you go to a gas station to fill your uh, or inflate your tire, still you talk in pounds per square inch units, okay. 32 psi, if you are driving a huge vehicle truck, it, it is 120 psi and so on, right. So, let us go into some details and look at the section, okay, from this angle. So, let us say that the tyre okay, that is how it is deformed, okay, let us say that the tyre is, is deformed like this, right. So, when you look at it from this section or the whatever be the section that is how the tyre is deformed. Okay. For a moment, I am taking out the tread and I am saying that the tyre has a thickness something like that, right. That is what is the inflation pressure, okay, which we have used in order to inflate the tyre, okay. When we inflate the tyre, we get the, what is called as the inflation pressure. So, now we know very well that we know very well equilibrium equations, we know very well that whatever infinitesimal element you take should be under equilibrium between the forces that are acting on this infinitesimal elements. Okay. So, obviously, when I take an infinitesimal element here, okay, I said contact pressure is what is acting in that region, right. So, if I have, if I want this to be under equilibrium or if I, I want it to be under equilibrium, then the pressure that is acting, the contact pressure that is acting should equilibrate the inflation pressure, okay when it is full contact, when it is in full contact. Okay. So, the contact pressure should be equal to the inflation pressure. Okay. Contact pressure should be equal to the inflation pressure. So, strictly speaking, the contact pressure should have been uniform. Okay. But contact pressures are never uniform, we will see more more about it a bit later, because of the local bending, because of the bending of the side walls, these are called side walls and all that. So, the contact pressure is never uniform. Okay. It has a particular shape, we will study this okay, after two or three classes. Right. So, now, now let me come back. So, in other words, there is a lot of theory as to how contact pressure develops, how contact pressure is distributed, whether it is uniform, whether it is not uniform and all those things. Okay. Now, here when I talk about this, I am only talking about the pressure okay, because of the tread okay, as it travels along the or around the circumstance, circumstance I mean circumference. Okay. So, here I am looking at, a, at the pressure on the tread. Okay. So, the pressure on the tread compresses, okay, goes to a maximum and then gets released. Okay. So, let us not right now confuse between this and this, we will, we will come to that later. So, the contact pressure what we are talking about is because of the tread getting compressed, right. When the tire is stationary, okay, then we have a contact pressure something like this, because there are a number of treads, there is one tread that is getting compressed, 
another thread com getting compressed a bit more, another thread much more, another thread slightly less and so on. So, number of threads are involved at various compressive positions okay, and hence we have we have a contact pressure like that of the threads that are formed. Okay. On the other hand, let us now roll the tire. Let us now roll the tire. Okay. Now, when I roll the tire, let me follow a thread. So, that is for a, for a static. So, I am just removing that. Let us now roll the tire. When I roll the tire, one thread or one block, that block is what we are going to follow, that block gets compressed, okay, goes to a maximum compression and then gets released. So, one block here, okay, that block as I rotate the tire or as the tire revolves goes into this position, it is the same block, goes into this position, maximum compression goes out and gets completely released. So, in other words, in other words, a block gets loaded like that okay, and then gets unloaded. Now, how is, how is that it is going to be unloaded? It is going to be unloaded like this. So, unload it like this. So, as the blocks gets loaded and unloaded, blocks gets loaded and unloaded, these blocks lose energy or hysteresis develops in these blocks. Clear? It is not only the blocks that gets compressed or loaded and unloaded, but the sides of the tire they also go through the same thing. So, in other words, the sides of the tire gets also loaded and unloaded and so on. Okay. So, in other words, this loading and unloading cycle gives rise to this energy loss and that has to be accounted for by the vehicle. I am just repeating that so that you understand it and that is quite clear. Now, how does this loading unloading cycle affects that contact patch okay, in a very simple setting as we had seen. How does that gets affected? Because the loading cycle or loading path is different from the unloading path. How does that get affected? So, it was symmetric when it was stationary, that is fine. But when it gets loaded and unloaded, look at this, this carefully, for the same strain, for the same strain in the unloading path, the stress is less, less. Okay. So, now we are talking about the pressure okay, that is acting on the treads. Since for loading and unloading they are different, this curve cannot be symmetric because they are both of them are not the same. So, they cannot this this guy is due to loading, this is due to unloading. Okay. So, they cannot be symmetric because I am following the same tread okay, which is going through the cycle. So, it cannot be the same. So, how it should be? This has to be a different curve, this has to be a different curve. So, the curve actually shifts and becomes like this. The curve actually shifts and becomes something like this. Because it is the loading curves are different from unloading curve, the curve you know the symmetry is lost becomes something like this. 
if I now say that the reaction force in order to support, this is not a very correct picture, that is why I introduced this inflation pressure, keep that in mind, we will come back to this topic again, okay. not a very correct picture, we are going to see very interesting things, how inflation pressure is going to act and how actually the tyre carries a load, you know, we are going to get to details there. Okay. So, we will come to that a bit later, but let us now understand this from a different angle okay, and give an explanation only to the rolling resistance. We will refine it as we go along. So, if this is the load that is acting on the tyre, then the load is now equilibrated from the ground or in other words that is the load that is going to act okay, which opposes the weight. Now, since this uh, uh, symmetric distribution is affected, what will be my resultant force due to this, this contact with the ground? The resultant force which is developed due to this compression which opposes the load that is on the tyre would now get displaced and hence actually instead of acting right at the centre, the load now acts Okay, away from the center right? and that is how the load acts. When it acts away from the center, then if I now look at that load with respect to this center, not only I am going to equilibrate this load with this force, but I am also creating an additional effect correct. So, what is that additional effect? That will be a torque that will be acting or a moment that will be acting like that. Right? Watch carefully that the moment is now going to oppose the motion of the tyre. Okay? So, there is an opposing force or opposing moment that is acting. Okay. Now, I do not want to put that moment here, I know that I know that the moment opposes the motion. So, I just want to replace this moment by means of a force that is acting here, okay. because that will oppose the motion of the vehicle. So, I replace I replace this moment which in reality exists because of this coelasticity by a force here. Okay, and call this as rolling resistance force and say that this force rolling resistance force creates the same moment which opposes in other words F r into r is equal to this into this. We will give names to that in a minute. So, first let us understand the philosophy of development of a rolling resistance force. So, the philosophy of this rolling resistance force to summarize is the viscoelastic behavior of the elastomer, which means that there is a loss of energy, which means that the symmetric contact pressure distribution when it is stationary gets affected or in other words it becomes skewed okay, and the skewed distribution produces a force, normal force okay, which not only opposes or not only supports the vehicle or the or the tire, but also creates a moment which opposes the motion and the opposing uh, <coughs> moment or motion or, or a torque is now also depicted as a force which opposes the motion of the vehicle or the tire and we call that as the rolling resistance force. Clear? Okay. So, that is why we have a rolling resistance force. The rolling resistance force, of course, you can see this very clearly, rolling resistance force, since it comes out of a moment which supports the, the weight W. Okay. So, this force has to be proportional to W. Right. So, we usually write the rolling resistance force to be a rolling resistance coefficient multiplied by W multiplied by W.
obviously the rolling resistance opposes the vehicle motion and hence is not within quotes a good force okay it's not aiding us to travel actually it it's opposing you since it's opposing you or opposing the motion of the vehicle we consume energy because i have to overcome that like you have the aerodynamic forces we have rolling resistance forces which opposes the motion interestingly note that when the vehicle brakes when the vehicle brakes this rolling resistance force would act in the same direction as that of the braking force which is now going to flip and act from the other direction so rolling resistance force aids in braking and opposes traction clear okay so the first thing you would tell that uh, i mean why not i completely reduce uh, rolling resistance go to zero is it possible how how low you can go there are lot of issues we will come to that later when we talk, talk about tire mechanics so first things first so that is the rolling resistance force which is written in terms of a rolling resistance coefficient and w okay our next step is to find out wf and wr okay and wf determined by taking a moment about the point a and wr determined by taking a moment about the point b okay so on one hand we have wf into l is equal to on the other hand you are going to write down the moment due to the forces okay so you know this very well so wf into l is in the clockwise direction so accordingly put the forces in the moment okay uh, rather uh, the moment due to the forces put the signs properly and we will see how we end up with this equation in the next class we are going to make some assumptions okay with respect to this heights we would see that usually in a passenger car these heights are almost the same and we will make an assumption that ha is equal to h is equal to ht okay that makes our life simple one of the things which is obvious which all of us experience which you would immediately notice is that wf and wr is going to get affected when a vehicle is accelerating okay or in other words that is what is called as a load transfer you would have noticed this when you go in a vehicle in a car obviously all of us know it very simple mechanics that when you accelerate you tend to fall back and when you brake you tend to fall forward in other words there's a load transfer to the axles as well it has a very interesting effect so we are go, we'll write down this equation we'll find out wf and wr then we will look at traction and braking and so on okay we'll stop here and we'll continue in the next class